Okay, ladies and gentlemen, well, I think it's uh, time for me to say a very warm welcome to you this morning uh, and to thank you for joining us on this webinar to launch the 2020 edition of the Energy Barometer, which is our annual report produced by the Energy Institute. For those of you that don't know, my name is Louise Kingham and I'm CEO of the Energy Institute, which is a global chartered membership body for those working in and around energy. And I'm delighted this morning to be joined by uh, Steve Holliday. Steve is President of the Energy Institute and Fellow of the Royal Academy, as well as the EI, who spent the last 10 years of his career in National Grid as CEO and prior to that in the oil and gas industry and now has a variety of energy related interests. Also joining me is Dr. Rob Gross. Rob is a member of the EI Council and chairs our Energy Advisory Panel, which is an important group that oversees the work that is produced in the end as the barometer report we're talking about today. And in his day job, he is director of the UK Energy Research Centre, probably known to most of you as UKIRK for short. So a word about why this report matters for all of you. Well, Energy professionals, in my experience, are a pretty hard-headed bunch uh, that, uh, like evidence bases, like no-nonsense, love practicality. They worry all the time about the evidence base, which helps us to determine how we keep the electrons and the molecules flowing into our homes and our businesses and obviously our vehicles. And we benefit from their work day in, day out, and especially actually during these extraordinary times that we're all living in. But it also means, importantly, that their views are worth listening to because they know what they're talking about, which is why I always look forward to this annual exercise to understand what energy professionals are thinking about and concerned about when we produce the barometer report. The survey itself is based on responses from more than 350 energy professionals within our UK membership, selected to represent views from right across the energy system, actually, from oil and gas through to renewables and energy efficiency, and from those who are accomplished and experienced in, in their work and in their careers and probably fellows of the Energy Institute, as well as those who are just embarking and starting out within the first five years of their experience of building a career in the sector. And it's presented this year as an interactive web page, which actually went live yesterday, a little earlier than planned to get ahead of the Chancellor's economic update. And we'll be hearing a lot more shortly, too, about what action members think that the government should pursue in the context of what is a busy week of announcements uh, and, uh, and sharing of information. But this is the sixth barometer, and this year it's a bit different in that it looks at the future all the way out to 2050, in fact, and the prospects and options for net zero, which makes it all the more powerful and important as a discussion that we need to have. And I guess I would say what, a, what an extraordinary year it's been for the world, but also, of course, for the sector, both in terms of what was planned and what was not and where we find ourselves now. And it's against this extraordinary backdrop, obviously, of COVID-19 and global lockdowns and the impacts on all sectors, as well as our own, and unprecedented reductions in economic activity, in mobility, surface, sea and air, of course, and therefore on, on energy demand itself, alongside reductions also in energy investment and, of course, greenhouse gas emissions. But a lot else has happened in the year too, and these events are obviously fresh in the minds of those who complete the barometer survey and share their thinking with us. And this timeline that you can see on the screen is actually a timeline taken from the report. And if you look just over the year, you can see the preeminence of the energy transition in our energy system is clear. Actually, coal coming off the grid, renewables starting to outflank fossil fuels, net zero into law, almost as, with as little opposition, actually, as when the Climate Change Act itself was passed a decade earlier. The climate strikes around the world and the announcement of the UK taking the presidency of COP26, which, of course, is now subsequently delayed until later in 2021. And uncertainty is then caused by Brexit, well, the transition period, the oil price war between Saudi and Russia, and of course, COVID-19 itself and the unexpected drops that that had in energy demand and continues to do so, the uncertainties of how that might uh, return and in what time frame. So before I hand over to Steve and Rob to present some of the findings to you, I do want to flag to you that we have a great opportunity for some Q&A as, uh, as we come to the end of those two presentations from Steve and Rob. So I would urge you to pop your questions, please, into the chat box function which you can see by tapping on the menu bar at the bottom of your screens, I suspect. And uh, Daniel is going to collate the questions. So please send your questions to Daniel and he will pick those up and we will try to get to as many of those as we can 
at the end of the presentations in the time that we have. Of course, please do feel free to post those questions anytime. Don't hang on until the end. Actually, it will help me as your chair to be able to see what's coming through and what you're thinking about so that I can ask those of the panel. And if you can remember to say who you are, and if you can, where you're from, uh, we'll try to get to, to as many of you as we can. And if you feel like tweeting and sharing thoughts at the same time, obviously use the Energy Institute tag and the hashtag Energy Barometer. Or post on LinkedIn. We'd like to hear from you that way too, if you prefer. So now, without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to the e Energy Institute's president, Steve Holliday. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Louise, and good morning, everybody. I hope you're all well. Um, so let's, I guess what Rob and I are going to take you through is uh, six six areas. There are six there are six areas that have, have come out of, of this come out of our members here. So we'll walk you through those, and we should have some time, as Louise says, at the end for some for some Q and A. I'd like to stress at the point that you made because I. The few times I've been involved with a barometer, an awful lot of the audience you you tend to think it, it comes from a narrow section of the industry, but it really doesn't. You know, it comes from right the way across the industry, oil and gas, renewables, as we said, energy efficiency, some of the technology actually companies now as well. And when you dig into this data, you find that you don't actually get huge differences of, of opinion. So although we talk about a percentage of, um, of participants saying X, please don't misconstrue that as well, that percentage actually represents the oil and gas industry. Because, it, because actually the answers to these questions we check are pretty, are pretty common across uh, all, the, all the industries. And for the last five years, every year, the, the survey starts by opening, um, opening questions saying, what do you think is the biggest challenge facing the industry for the coming year? And this year, the top four, as you can see on the slide, low carbon energy, energy policy, climate change, and COVID. So it's a pleasant change to not see the Brexit there because that's dominated this slide for the, for the past few years. And of course, who would have predicted that COVID was going to be there? So the key theme when I, when I look at all these bits of data though that runs through these four is one word that links them all together and that's uncertainty. I just take low carbon energy to start with. The main message that's coming out here is a lack of coherence in planning for decarbonisation across the total economy. While there's great progress um, in decarbonising the power sector, which, which I'll, I'll come on to again in a moment, our members are urging that we move beyond that and focus, unsurprisingly, on heat as the next big challenge. Similar to previous years, energy policies always there. It's, uh, it continues to be seen as lacking in focus and long-term planning. And our members are fearing that that will jeopardize our position in transitioning to a low carbon economy. Uh, and very concerned about the allocation of costs, but actually who pays here. Sustainability and climate change, no surprise, as the, with the adoption of the net zero target, it's got minds very focused indeed. Real stressing as well that this is not just a UK challenge, of course, it's a global challenge. And the two themes we often talk about, which, which is the balancing act between how do we get clean energy to the billions that don't have it right now, while at the same time actually, actually reducing emissions. Of course, as, as you saw on the timeline that Louise showed, this survey actually went out right uh, in, in the middle of COVID uh, during, during the first four weeks of March. And as people were filling this in and sending it out, surprisingly, it just got mentioned more and more. And in fact, we did a supplementary on COVID, which I'll come on to with a, ask a few other questions as it was clearly such an issue. Um, I mean, everybody on this will completely understand this. I think in terms of you know what, what people are thinking um, the issues are going to be. And you can see you know, a huge vote here, that particularly on flights, that reductions on flights are going to be with us for a long time to come and you can work your way down this chart quite understandably road and rail also with huge reductions that people are expecting to remain for an extended period of time uh, interesting when you get down to the bottom of this chart in terms of greenhouse gas emissions you, you, know, you probably know on a global basis our co2 emissions have been down enormously it's 50 50 isn't it on this chart here about people expecting that to sort of stay for a, a long period of time or bouncing back pretty quickly. If you take a look at the biggest challenges that EI members uh, see and what they see 
I'll put the next slide up, please. And I love these because I love the graphs that show us, you know, how views are changing over the course of a period of years, actually. And uh, the message is pretty clear. You know, we want a resilient energy system and an economy that's strong. Um, but, you know, the, the trend lines are very clear. You know, the increasing challenge is low carbon energy and sustainability and climate change. We pop the COVID on there, as you can see, as a one-off. But those two lines on, on low carbon energy and sustainability just been climbing year on year on year for the last few years. Now, our members clearly want the UK to turn the discontinuity on at the moment caused by COVID into an opportunity, into the moment in which we got real about the climate threat, how that links in with our future economy and our responsibility to the world. Think about the biggest successes of the last 10 years, because it is, of course, 2020 it was the first milestone year for some of the climate targets on a global basis. We asked them also about what opportunities have been, have been missed in the past 10 years. And the next slide shows, first of all, the successes. No great surprise, I don't think, you know, the great successes here, the two stories, very clear. Just the rate at which we've introduced renewables into our power system in the UK here. That stands out. That's, that's chosen by more than half of all the respondents here. And around the respondents chose our switch from coal to gas. Uh, of course, it is a more recent. And we also asked them about you know, what were the factors? What were the key factors behind these successes? You can see the growth in, in renewables. The key factors were falling, the falling costs of, of the technology. And of course, the, the financial support that was, that was given through incentives and CFDs, et cetera. And on the other hand, on the coal side, you know, setting a mandatory standard, and regulating a timetable in place where we're going to switch off the coal. I think the key thing that comes through both of those again, though, is just consistency. You know, that's those uh, enablers weren't short, sharp injections. You know, they've been around for a while now. So that consistency of approach has led to this success. And if I turn then to the, the missed opportunities, we'll talk a lot about this this morning, but in this irritating it again, it, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about energy efficiency. Energy efficiency continues to be seen as a, a huge missed opportunity. It's echoed in the previous question, actually, because only a minority um, of respondents identified energy efficiency improvements either in buildings or our processes as a as a success in the last decade every year we i think we produce this you know it's always popped out as a huge piece that you know we should emphasize more energy efficiency it's a huge potential etc last year in 2019 i recall it was singled out as the best way to ensure the low carbon transition helps uh, and does so in an affordable way for people other, other, other most opportunities, interestingly, includes renewables. And this is more on the heat side, um, where we've really not made any progress on the heat. New nuclear power, carbon capture, and we'll talk a little bit later on about carbon capture and usage and storage. And if I look at the risk, the perception of risk of investments, it's, not a huge switch, if I recall this chart from last year. Uh, CCUS and nuclear power viewed as high risk investments, and that's due to the policy uncertainty. And if you work your way down here, you know, you, you'll, you'll see a sort of a relationship between those things that have had, had consistent support, not just financial support, but rhetoric as well, I think. Um, the nuclear, new nuclear and carbon capture and storage really standing out here. So the next section is on targets. And the UK emissions reduction targets, central focus of this year's barometer. Nine in 10 say that we're off track for net zero by 2050. If I can just get you just to focus a little bit on this chart, because this chart is quite interesting for me, because of course we changed the target in the course of the last year. Um, <clears throat> from the 80% reduction here. But you can see both the degree of optimism in here as well, that significantly 
more people are believing we're on track for significant reductions in our carbon emissions from the 1990 levels. But when it comes down to you know the very light blue there, the net zero or negative emissions by 2050, then it's just the 10% think we're actually on track to do that. So still short, still think, despite this ambition that at, at the moment uh, we're expecting to fall short. But I, th but I take a bit of optimism as well about the absolute levels of reductions, though year on year seem to be significantly improved. And the next chart is probably the chart that I worry most about. <clears throat> I'll get you to just look at that headline. More than half don't even expect us to meet the fifth carbon budget, which is the 2028. This is the decade. If we really don't start to motor in the course of this decade, then things become very difficult in the 30s and 40s here. If we're not on track for this, this I think is particularly concerning. And to meet the shortfall in the fifth carbon budget and least costs, our members think the government should prioritise energy efficiency, transport and heat. No great surprises there, I don't think. It's a consistent call to action around energy efficiency. It's been, the, been our top choice in meeting a shortfall in, in emissions reductions for the past four years. Louis mentioned COP26. Uh, it's come through in a lot of commentary here um, that not only is urgent action required by us to make sure that we are on our path to success in 2050, but if we're to come out of COP26 in, we, with the leadership that we aspire on the climate and the credibility that we aspire to, then we really need to make sure we are setting an example at home. Big set of messages around you know, action pre COP26 so that we can stand proud at COP26 in November 2021. As I said, we did ask then some supplementary questions around COVID, and the next chart covers that. And you can see that there's quite a split here on this chart. And it's interesting, I've listened to a lot of people. Uh, give their views on this over the past month or so. 40% think the pandemic will hasten the transition. Behaviour changes obviously sit behind that, the working from home, reductions in commuting and flights, etc. You know, that's sort of leading a lot of our members, I think, to predict that individuals are more likely to make choices in the future that favour low carbon. Additionally, um, a number of our members are thinking that the Align the stimulus package with net zero and really accelerate the transition. But on the flip side of that, you've got over a third of respondents that actually actually believe that it will hinder the transition. With respondents worrying about the impacts of the pandemic on the economy and, and therefore less investment available for the transition and new energy projects and less focus from a political point of view on this versus the general economy. And with low oil prices and fears about public transport, of course, you know, people are concerned about uh, the propensity to drive more in, in some cars. I actually sat on an international discussion around this, interestingly, uh, about three weeks ago now, with respondents from um, Asia, um, Australia, New Zealand, across Europe and the US. And the split was very similar, interestingly. You know, about a third were absolutely gung ho. This is really going to accelerate the transition. A third were it's not, and the third were sort of undecided. And we're flipping during the course of the debate. It flipped on a global basis. Interestingly, I mean, the US, unsurprisingly, were absolutely negative on this. Whereas a lot of the Europeans were much more optimistic that this was a uh, big step in terms of accelerating the pace of decarbonisation overall. Anyway, that's the end of my three parts. So I'm going to hand over to Rob, who will take you through the second half of the results. Rob. Thanks, Steve. And uh, good morning, everyone. If Louise or Steve could just give me a quick thumbs up that I'm coming through loud and clear. That's brilliant. Thank thanks very much. OK, so um, what I'm going to talk about is three or well, the three big uh, uh, 
actor groups, if you like, the big players. Uh, so industry, government and citizens or consumers. Um, and uh, what the Energy Institute um, members think the role of each of those, uh, of us really, is um, in, uh, in this transition. Um, <clears throat> we're going to deal with government first, rightly or wrongly. Um, and so the first question that, uh, that I can draw your attention to, the answers around whether government is doing enough to meet net zero. I think that speaks for itself. Um, so in, if it's red, it means that the, uh, the, the, the members disagreed. Uh, so I think that's 71% or so with a, uh, a disagree or strongly disagree. 15% uh, were a bit like weren't sure one way or the other, uh, which leaves, um, what is it there? 13% uh, of members think that the government is doing enough. Um, that's a little bit unsurprising. Uh, obviously, this came out before uh, recent announcements about energy efficiency. Uh, sorry, the, the, the survey was undertaken before the recent announcements, of course, about energy efficiency in buildings. That's a thing we're going to come back to. It'll be interesting to see whether, whether things change as the government uh, responds to COVID and does more, perhaps, uh, in the coming year or so. Next slide. The next uh, question that I'm going to tackle was, uh, what are the first steps? So they were asked about the first steps questions, um, and uh, the, the, the answers there were focused around those kind of um, harder to decarbonise uh, sectors, such as aviation and um, heavy goods vehicles and so on. Uh, and you can see they're coming out quite clearly uh, around support for low carbon aviation fuel, hydrogen uh, for some uh, sectors, and uh, the shifting of freight, uh, uh, you know, modal shift, although the scale of the requirements of doing so uh, are quite daunting, uh, something that shouldn't be um, underestimated. Next slide, please. Next steps, uh, sorry, key first steps uh, also recommended around uh, domestic heating and uh, and CCUS. Uh, domestic heat has has gone from being quite literally the Cinderella of uh, of decarbonisation to being right at the top of the agenda. I think in in the minds of many energy professionals and certainly within the academic community. Um, and there's a, a huge amount of work that needs to be done. So, not surprisingly, we see low carbon heating technology there. Some really really big choices and their policy choices, which the government needs to face up to, um, for example, around um, the role of uh, heat pumps or hydrogen, potentially, uh, in providing heating for homes. Uh, we've seen an announcement yesterday about energy efficiency. Obviously, there was a manifesto commitment to do even more. So, I mean, that's certainly one to watch at the moment. And members also have drawn attention to uh, the importance of carbon capture, capture and storage. Um, very, very few of the deep decarbonisation scenarios uh, looking out to 2050 and beyond on a global basis don't see some kind of requirement or role uh, for carbon capture. And yet it seems to have been the one that's most difficult to, to even get those demonstration plants off, off the ground. So again, I think that's an interesting one to watch, come back to, and I'm sure there'll be some Q&A over what I've just said. Next, next slide. Right, so um, as Steve's already said, in, in, the, uh, in the light of um, recent developments and the unprecedented situation we found ourselves in, um, the team at the Energy Institute actually went back to members with a supplementary uh, set of questions um, around uh, green stimulus, green recovery, building back better, uh, you know, whatever it might be called. And, um, the questions in this particular instance were focused around the letter that the that Lord Deben, the chair of the Committee on Climate Change, wrote uh, to the Prime Minister uh, a couple of months ago now, I think, uh, around the role of, um, of the clean growth strategy, the net zero targets, and building back greener, and, and so on. And, and essentially, the, the, the questions here around uh, which of those statements the Energy Institute uh, membership most strongly agree with. And I'm sure you're absorbing that as you read the slide now. And I won't try and talk through all of it, but 
you can see there right at the top of the table is um, making sure that the, the least able to uh, to pay are not disadvantaged. So the kind of concept of uh, of just recovery and a fair distribution of uh, of the costs of uh, of any changes that might be uh, uh, might be required. Interestingly, um, the second highest is whether or not we can do so. This really speaks to uh, the observations that Steve was just making in his conversations with colleagues from different continents, different parts of the world around the role of social norms. Uh, we've already seen in, the, in, in, in some of the announcements from the Chancellor some prioritisation of, uh, of climate related investments. Uh, and we've also seen at least some words around um, carbon targets uh, for carbon intensive sectors uh, such as, as aviation. So very, very interesting to watch how this one will unfold uh, as we look out over the next uh, into the autumn, into the uh, the autumn statement and so on. Next slide. OK, so that was one of three policy. Uh, second of the three uh, is uh, what the energy industry professionals think about their own industry. Uh, so interestingly, um, the question there is uh, whether or not en energy industry professionals think the energy industry is doing enough and two thirds of them don't think that the energy industry uh, is, is is doing enough. Um, so the, 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 the share on the pie chart there is not dissimilar actually to what we saw for, uh, for their views about government. Um, perhaps uh, a, a little bit more ambiguity around whether or not we as an industry are doing enough, but certainly big changes are, are are needed um, and some big changes are already underway. Next slide. So, I mean, Steve was mentioning the split of the Energy Institute membership and I'd reiterate his points about uh, Energy Institute being a very broad church these days uh, and representing you know, new, new energy as well as the uh, incumbent uh, uh, energy players and uh, energy consultancies and expertise and academics and so on. And so, I mean, this slide is really uh, a, a kind of transitional slide. Uh, I think one of the things that, it, that you can extract from the, the, the findings here in the survey is that um, our membership is expecting a gradual transition. Uh, it's expecting uh, the, a continuing uh, but changed role uh, for for the existing uh, incumbent companies. Now, this is not. I should stress this. This is not just the oil and gas industry saying that we think we'll still be in business uh, in, in 2050. I mean, obviously, perhaps some some members were were fall, would fall into that category, but there's much wider uh, church than that, as I've said. Uh, and you can see that that expectation from a significant percentage of our uh, respondents um, that the role in 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 2050. Uh, will be significantly different uh, from the role uh, now and even from the role in uh, in 10 years time. So moving towards the lower carbon away from their traditional products and towards new forms of energy, uh, energy services, relatively few Energy Institute members think there won't be a role for those companies at all. Next slide. Okay, so the, the final set of um, questions that were put to the membership uh, surrounded the role of individuals. So the role of us as citizens, uh, whether we're citizens um, exerting uh, pressure. Um, so if our, with our little um, people um, there with no arms, uh, so one of, one of the little groups of people with no arms is waving a placard. Uh, so, so what we what we, we were talking about here is drivers of change, and so in particular, um, the, the the kind of activist groups. Uh, bearing in mind when the when the survey was open, the the events that that unfolded last year, which obviously seemed like another universe now, uh, with uh, protests from Extinction Rebellion and others, and and the whole climate and environmental pollution concerns more widely, plastics and oceans and so on, is being, being, being pushed right up to the top of the agenda and being very significant in the, the election campaign. So, so our members 
see, uh, understandably, that consumer citizen pressure is the biggest driver, or a very significant driver of decarbonisation. But if you look over to the right, our little people there in the middle, um, they also see is that not actually doing enough or being able to do enough um, in our own lives is, is, is the second largest of the three categories there of things that are effectively uh, impediments to change. So barriers uh, to meeting net zero. So I think what's key there is to think about um, the relationship between us as individuals, government and industry in enabling change. So maybe consumers at the moment are not sufficiently enabled to, ch to make changes, perhaps they don't have enough information, lots of barriers uh, despite their um, um, enthusiasm for change. So next slide I think amplifies that point. So yes, so so the the the, the what, what we are, need to be mindful of is the extent to which individuals are actually able to be effective agents for change. So the energy system is uh, complex, multifaceted, techno-economic, social, institutional system, and the ability of us as individuals to affect change is effect is is a product of all of those things. And so the the next uh, area that the the barometer deals with is around policies to enable change. And uh, so two things uh, float to the top. Uh, and have been, uh, have been, you know, we're drawing your attention to in the slide. So, so the first is the provision of low carbon infrastructure. So that would be whether the uh, we have the wherewithal, for example, to move to to heat pumps or uh, to to green hydrogen to to power our our homes to to, to heat our homes. Uh, charging infrastructure for, uh, for for electric vehicles, which I heard mention of um, when the chancellor was interviewed on the Today program this morning. Um, and then the second is thinking about the cost. So thinking about the affordability, um, quite what the direct lever is for policy to pull to make things cheaper. Obviously, we can have a conversation about, uh, but we've got lots of experience now of the, the idea of learning by doing a cost reduction uh, initially enabled by policy. Um, and so the, those are the two top things uh, that the that survey identified around consumers wanting to make changes, perhaps not being able to and not knowing how to, um, and hence uh, uh, policies to enable change uh, being around costs and infrastructure. So next slide, please. Okay. Um, uh, final slide uh, uh, that I had previously had has gone, which is great, which means I'll shut up sooner. <laughs> uh, and now we're moving to Q&A, so thanks very much. Thanks very much indeed, Rob, and, and thank you too to Steve. So there's an awful lot for you to digest, and I saw the participant numbers climbing while we've been talking. So, uh, and as I said at the beginning, don't worry, we will be um, obviously sharing this uh, with you more widely, and you'll be able to take a deep dive into all of the content you've seen uh, Rob and Steve walk you through just now. Uh, and still feel free to su submit your questions. I've already got some that have come through. So, um, but just while you're thinking about the things that you'd like to ask, I, I guess the takeaways, um, certainly as I've been listening to you, I, I'm quite taken by the fact that four in five want stimulus channeled into green industries and jobs. I, I guess we shouldn't be surprised in, in the week that we're in, uh, given the announcements I heard, but bearing in mind this is people talking back just as the, the pandemic was taking hold. Uh, globally, it, it, it's interesting that members were already making that observation as being really, really important. Um, and also, uh, I think for me, the other takeaway is around the support for polluting sectors being made contingent on them taking action, positive action around improving their performance as, as, as they impact on the climate, which is really, really, really powerful and important. And I guess um, lines up too with other commentators like the and, and advisory groups and advisory bodies to government too and I think about them some of the things that the Committee on Climate Change recommend. I think the second point that I picked up on was uh, around 90% saying that we're currently off track for, for net zero by 2050 and more than half of those saying that even uh, we're even off track for the 2030 interim targets actually uh, which you know really um, heightens your, your, your thinking around this and, and the fact that we really do, it does feel like we're very much out of time and we need to really get on and we, yet we feel like we've been saying this for probably too long already. 
And then I guess the third point, which does relate to, again, so yesterday's announcement around the retrofit of UK housing being identified as by members as the number one route for both recovery and net zero uh, because of the economic, social and environmental co-benefits, really, really important. And, and I guess, um, and maybe some people will have views about that, but certainly from a personal point of view, I very much hope what was announced yesterday is the first step in what needs to be a sort of considered and, and, and long-term program if we're really to have the kind of impact that we want. So as I said at the beginning, we, uh, we welcome your questions and your thoughts. Uh, there's quite a few of you online at the moment, so do feel free to submit those into the chat box for Daniel to pick up. Uh, and he will try and uh, marshal those and, and whiz those through to me. So I've got a, I've got a few that have already come in that I'll, I'll kick off with, uh, with on, if I may. So a question to both of you, uh, first of all. So it says, uh, we, we had a split in the, the views of members around whether or not the pandemic and its impacts would accelerate our progress towards net zero ultimately or um, would slow us down. And, and I'm asked, what do each of you feel? Which, which camp do you in uh, and why? So um, Rob, should I start with you? Okay. Thanks for starting with me. I mean, that's uh, that's that's a really, really difficult question. Um, and uh, I wrote a little blog about this uh, on, on the UK website um, near, near the kind of earlier in, into lockdown. Um, you know, I mean, this sounds kind of very equivocal, but but the uncertainties are extremely large and the, 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 the picture at the moment is quite mixed. Um, I think that what many in the energy uh, community were quite concerned to do was to avoid a repeat of the situation that we had in 2008 with the financial crisis when uh, the kind of concern about climate change completely fell off the agenda and such stimulus as there, as there initially was of course stimulus very quickly gave way to austerity and I think we need to think about that lesson as we go further forward into uh, into this um, but such stimulus as, as, as initially took place, the kind of it was green tinge and it wasn't very green. So I think the first thing is if, if there is and the, the, the Chancellor is doing all sorts of ambitious things at the moment to try and get the government to try and get um, the economy moving again and to stimulate uh, 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 consumption in particular. Um, so 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 keeping the, uh, the the kind of you know, this came through in the survey, you know, what we should be doing first, uh, the, the, the opportunities to create jobs, economic benefit, uh, potentially reduce bills and at the same time uh, tackle the, the, the climate agenda. Uh, so, so the energy efficiency in, in, in domestic buildings is the most obvious and, and often cited. So if we can keep those things at the forefront, there's every opportunity for it to, 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 to be an opportunity. Um, there are numerous threats, and we just we we need to be mindful. You know, we need to be to be to be realistic about the about the context. Um, if I were in government, you know, I would be. Uh, I think you would be quite legitimately concerned about the uh, the tourism industry, aviation in particular. Um, not not you know the carbon intensive sectors um, uh, and may, can be in, uh, major contributors to to aspects of, of economic growth, and we need to be thinking. And, and be open and, and realistic about about the, the the challenges that the government faces. Okay, and Steve, how about you? What do you think? Oh, you're on mute. Just take I'm, on mute. I'm on mute. There, <laughs> I, guess I, I, I guess I'm not quite as pessimistic as Rob, although everything he says makes eminent sense. And 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 the reasons for that, I think, are uh, one is before COVID, you know, the, the step change we've seen on the ESG front with investors in particular, which we saw through IP week, you know, massive push from in investors for uh, the energy industry itself to really lead on decarbonisation and change. I think the consumer pressure and public pressure uh, hasn't gone away despite COVID. I think that that's still there as well. And I think we've, you know, we've seen some bold leadership across across things. So from an energy point of view, I actually, I actually, I, I'm really optimistic that things will not change as a result of the pandemic. On the flip side of that, actually, when you look at what what Germany has done in terms of its um, huge package of measures, I think that puts a bit of pressure on our government as well, actually, to think brave and think about rebuilding. I know it's a, it's a bit of a trite expression, but to rebuild better. And to make a lot of the uh, the uh, investments that they make contingent on people taking action, 
So I think I'm, I mean, I mean, when I vote on these things, I vote, I think it's going to accelerate. Um, that may be tainted with a degree of optimism, but I think lots of the pressure points are all pouring in the same direction at the moment. Yeah, there's, great, there's, sorry, Steve, go on. It's just a great opportunity and I hope, I hope we don't miss it. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I guess there's a related point in the chat from Sarah Vaughan from E.ON. She says, there's been a clear theme over many years that government energy policy is a weakness in terms of the UK's ability to meet its goals. How have things gone so wrong? Has the industry failed to convince government? Has politics played too great a role, e.g. the Conservative cut government cutting back on energy efficiency investment to reduce bills in response to Ed Miliband's price camp? What would you say to that? We tried a lot, haven't we? And Sarah knows this. You know, I mean, the industry's tried lots of ideas, and government have tried lots of initiatives. What we what we just have not had really is a long term consistency. The exceptions of those, as I mentioned in the survey that come through, I think are um, are the incentives and and the drive on renewables. And I know there are people in the renewables industry who think, well, hang on, a minute, we had the solar incentives and they were switched off, etc. But there has been, you know, a, a push and a determination that's been consistent. Energy efficiency has, you know, it has just been such a problem child. So many techniques have, have, have been attempted. Um, but when I've looked at those, they've been extraordinarily complex, extraordinarily administrative. And as Sarah knows her, herself, you know, putting the incentives on the supply companies early on, on to do that always seemed to me to be a strange thing to do. So when, when I, you know, when, when I think about this, I do think we need a concerted effort on energy efficiency. We need to stick with something. And before we jump in, we need to think very carefully about who are the right people in reality to put these incentives on to actually deliver a programme. Okay, and related to that, I've got a question in from Jeff Hardy. Hello, Jeff. He's talking about green finance. He says, Rob, Steve, in the EI, I'd like to see as the building blocks of a long lasting green stimulus, what would you like to see for bonus points in addition to financial stimulus? Do we need wider energy market and system reform to meet net zero targets? And do you have a view on what those might be? That's a bit of a corker question from Jeff. Rob, do you want to have a go at that to begin with? Uh, right. So, so Jeff, I think there's about four questions <laughs> uh, uh, that are all quite linked uh, in there. I'll, I'll, I'll try and have a go. I mean, just 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 to come back, just to rewind one step. I mean, perhaps Rob, I wasn't being pessimistic in my response. It might be, uh, you know typical academic fence sitting uh, about the prospects. I remain very optimistic in, in all things myself on a personal level. I think it's just a bit too early to, uh, to say for sure. I mean, so Jeff, I mean, Jeff's question, um, it links back to, to questions uh, around policy, I think. Um, so, so first of all, you know, what we saw, one of the reasons that the um, renewable electricity um, suite of policies that we've had in place since the beginning of the renewables obligation have been relatively successful is that they um they they sustained over time uh they they i mean look, lots of changes were made to the renewables obligation then we had the mr but we had sustained policy support in some form there was also a recognition by government around the emr period 2013 or so that um, providing investable you know thinking about the investment conditions uh, was uh, absolutely critical. And I think that we need to come back to that and think about what investors might be looking for if they're going to put, if money's going to flow into, into clean, clean growth of low carbon industries in the UK. So that's uh, a degree of foresight, uh, perhaps an element of de-risking. Certainly what we've seen with the contracts for difference is that that, that long run fixed price contract dimension is extremely important. Uh, has been important in driving investment and growth. There's, there's difficulties associated with that as well that, that I know that Jeff is mindful of. Um, to do, do, I mean, in terms of uh, uh, long lasting green stimulus, a few things, you know, uh, the, the regulatory environment is important as well. We've seen um, grants for, uh, for householders being announced uh, yesterday. What we also know from experience, long-standing experience, is that um, energy efficiency in particular uh, in, in appliances, buildings, um, and transport is driven by regulation. So we need to be thinking about that regulatory environment and boring on regulation is hugely important. Um, bonus points, uh, do we need wider energy market and system reform to meet net zero targets? Uh, yes, we do. 
But what we don't need at this stage is a massively disruptive uh, transformational um, uh, review of root and branch review of everything. So we, we, can, we can work with what we've got. We can take a gradualist approach and we need to be pragmatic about what drives investment. Yeah, I, 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 I'd agree. Sort of throwing it all up in the air or trying to start with a blank piece of paper is not really going to be workable for anybody. And the amount of time that would take is just just inconceivable, really. There's a there's a related question, Steve, which which you might want to come back on on on, on green finance here, which says uh, from Philip Selwood. He says, what what do we do in your experience of working with government and and sort of unlocking funds for programmes? How do we persuade Treasury that a one year program on energy efficiency is just completely inadequate to meet the challenge? <laughs> yeah, I completely and utterly agree with the sentiment. Uh, in fact, I was uh, being interviewed by somebody else earlier this week. Exactly. It's all different, isn't it? They're good to mark. It just isn't going to cut it. You know, it's not going to cut it. We need to create an energy efficiency industry. And you're not going to do yeah. that with one year of stimulus. So, you know, it has to be, I mean, I think linked to that question and the previous one, it's cons I mean, consistency breeds, breeds confidence and breeds inward investment, not just capital investment, but investment in the right skills as well. But I think this, you know, a, a, a confidence around consistency is just so important. And I wouldn't confuse when I talk to government consistency about putting in place something that is going to last for 10 years exactly as it is, because that's quite hard. And in fact, if you ask someone to do that, they spend so long trying to design a risk free example that we miss an opportunity. So I've, I've always been all about, I think, you know, get something out there that's going to kickstart something. And the renewables incentives was a good way of kickstarting something. We're finally as time goes on, but be really clear that we are going to give consistent support to this. It is a direction that we want to go on. And I, and I think on, on uh, Rob's comments on the regulatory environment, I'd agree with those and, and yours, Louise, actually. We cannot afford to throw everything up in the air because that's going to be inconsistency. It's, it's going to scare people. But the message I'd really like us to give everybody who invests in, in this sector is it's going to constantly evolve and we're going to keep evolving it so it does not get in the way. So don't feel it, it's an incumbency. And I know a lot of people on this call probably also would understand and realise that the, the process by which we make our regulatory change is outdated, outmoded and too slow. But we've got to find a way of getting some changes in place way faster than we do at the moment. I know there's some people even in the regulator who feel that way, that by the time the change has been, things have changed again to a certain extent and it's a bit late. So we've just got into those systems as well. So, so consistency uh, and a real, a real mindset of facilitating things through agile regulation would be my two big messages. Yeah, and you've got some. So you've got some. I totally agree with what Steve is saying right now. Is coming up in the uh, in the chat box from Joanne Joanne Wade. She said you just need to involve the supply chains in how the policy landscape evolves, so that they factor it into their business planning. And again, sort of building something for the longer term that's more robust and more stable. Um, I'm going to take us off to a different topic now. We've had a couple of questions in on, on your views on, on Brexit and why Brexit's dropped off the list. So we had one from Ian Byrne and one from Callum Chambers at Alexon. Uh, and, and essentially they're, they're saying, do you, do you, what do you think the reason is for this drop, for Brexit dropping off the top five uh, from the chart? Do you think that's because industry's had sort of some sense of reassurance uh, or just simply that other things have become a priority and we and, and, I, and I guess the implication there is, is we may be in as big a trouble as we were a year ago, uh, even though we're in transition. What's what's your view on that, Steve? I don't, I don't know the answer, actually. So, <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, it's it's dropped off the top five because I think COVID has come into the in, into the top four and five. So that's that's for sure. I I, I don't know. I. I suspect it's a little bit of um, we've given up to a certain extent is it will be what it will be now. Um, but the consequences of not getting some of the energy elements of Brexit right remain. I think it's dropped off a lot of people's agendas. And this is just a reflection of what's happening more broadly in society. Um, but I, you know, I think the, the issues around it, if we don't get the, the single energy market access and all of those things still sorted out, the cost of consumers in the UK is unchanged. It just hasn't made the top four this year. 
Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, that's true. Um, uh, one for you, Rob, has come in here from um, Bob Ward. He says, the May and Johnson governments have been sitting on energy white paper for at least a year. What indications have you had, if any, from government about when they will publish their white paper? Um, I don't know. It's the, it's the honest answer to that question. Uh, and to, to be, you know, if I did know, I probably wouldn't say in a public forum, but I actually don't know. Uh, and I think that to a certain extent, the officials that were, that were working on the white paper also don't know because the political context is so is so fast moving and uh, and rapidly changing. So um, and if, I think certainly that, that many of the aspirations that the government. So if you remember back to the kind of, you know, prehistory now, so 2018, when Greg Clark announced his four principles that were going to be the, the basis for the white paper. I mean, many of those things I don't think have, have gone away. Um, so I would uh, expect that there will be some, uh, some, some further changes and announcements uh, this year that relate to how we're actually going to gear up to do, to do net zero and to continue to, to make progress with the, so we must not forget, you know, for example, when we talk about this successful renewables, we need to do a, we need to keep going. We need to do a hell of a lot more with renewables. Um, governments reopened uh, CFDs to onshore wind and, and solar farms, which is a very welcome step in terms of lowest cost routes. There's still a big, um, so you know, Business Green ran a piece yesterday about sort of souring relations with China and what that might mean for, for nuclear. And we touched upon the need to do more with CCS. So all of those are supply side things and all of those things need to proceed. So along with what we've already been talking about on the demand side, um, we will need to see some announcements from government as we go forward. Now, whether there will be the parliamentary time and the political appetite for a white paper, I don't know. Whether we need one in order to, to make incremental and pragmatic and sensible changes to the existing policy landscape, well, I don't actually know that we necessarily do. And so I think what we would be looking for is that kind of forward visibility. You know, what will we be seeing in electricity market, in the electricity market? Will we move to make the CFD a floor rather than a fixed price to protect investors, but to get a bit more flexibility in? I mean, that's an, uh, an interesting possibility. I mean, just to come back on, on, on energy efficiency side, just to come back to, uh, to Phil Selwood's point, I mean, in fairness to the Chancellor, um, this was this was the kind of emergency bit. This was the provisions around the, the short term that were announced yesterday. We're still expecting further announcements in the autumn, which which I think we would hope will be where we're looking out over the longer term. And let's hope that's where that nine billion commitment or even more on the energy efficiency in, in buildings uh, stays in the frame and a recognition of the other actions that are needed also uh, stay in, in, in the conversation. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I certainly the things that I've heard or, or been told are coming and, and, and one of those came from a, an event that I was taking part in yesterday where Kwasi Kwarteng, the energy minister, was talking about um, various different um, programmes that he was hopeful they might see. And there was talk of the decarbonisation of transport plans still coming before the end of the year. There was talk about a buildings and heat strategy coming before the end of the year, announcements on green hydrogen coming. So it, I, I agree with you. I suspect that maybe a white paper is not how this will play out, but we will see it as either sector based uh, uh, plans that start to emerge and programmes and funding over the longer term rather than hanging our hats on, on a white paper particularly. We, we also need to be um, to be seen to be walking the talk when we get into the COP26 uh, hosting, uh, you know, delayed. I think it's, um, I mean, who, no, nobody wanted this to have been the reason for it, but it's probably to the, U, to, to the UK government's um, advantage that it's been delayed by a year because it gives us a bit more time to, to be ready. Yeah, so, absolutely. So again, you know, there's a, there's a strong political driver on that stage for us to have some some domestic some visible domestic progress yeah and there's a great question here in from malcolm brinded on that very point he says the world seems ever more split on climate ambition with some countries setting net zero goals and others prioritizing increasing energy provision as important or to drive domestic economic growth so what hope does cop or other related processes have to generate more global cohesion 
Are, are you asking me? Uh, oh, I, both of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay. I mean, yeah, that's a. I mean, that's a very tough question. I think I'd probably nuance it a bit, actually. Um, and I would say that even within the most ambitious countries, there are inconsistencies within uh, within the policy mix. So even Germany thinks it will take them another 18 years to phase out coal, for example. And if you look at uh, India and China, and even in the United States, you've seen uh, terrific progress with uh, renewables, uh, as well as a, a, a you know a continuing uh, you know perhaps need to burn to burn coal or to have cheap to, to have cheap fossil fuels. So I don't I don't I think I would I would characterise it as as a, as a kind of different re sort of um, different response to the, to a challenge. There's political factors which come into play. Uh, I, I wouldn't see this kind of I wouldn't perhaps characterise it as a split. Um, and I think that uh, I mean that makes it a really really big challenge for UK diplomacy looking into to COP26. Uh, we've heard talk about thinking about it on a sectoral basis. Uh, we've, we've heard talk of, of conceptualising it in terms of you know an action agenda, positive steps, um, and uh, and all of those things I think are where we need to be focusing minds in order to to, to enable change. Steve. Yeah, well, I, I, I want to combine Malcolm's and I think the previous one to, 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 to a certain extent. I mean, I'm not sure we need an energy right now. I mean, because because the problem with that is, as Rob was uh, intimating to a certain extent, it's thinking about energy in isolation. I mean, the whole net zero trajectory now requires systems thinking, which is across all sectors. So think about anything just going on its own without all the linkages. Which is tough for government. I mean, as a lot of people probably know, the Royal Academy of Engineering is doing a piece of advisory work for government on exactly this. And at the heart of all of that, which uh, is about you know how you think across all the systems to a certain extent. So, an energy white paper without a transport white paper at the same time, for example, without a construction and a buildings white paper at the same time, doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, but that's a big political challenge, isn't it, to get all of those things? So. Uh, Back to Malcolm's question in terms of COP, I mean, what, what I would like to see is, is the fact that there's a lot of complexity going to be thought through in the next period of time. However, while we wait for some of that systems thinking to come through, it's very clear that we should make huge progress on three or four things, um, just as we did on renewables on electric electricity. So I would start with that again, as, as Rob says, we need a lot more renewables, so we should continue that without question. We've got to get on with heat. We've got to get on with heat. I think we've got a pretty clear trajectory on a lot of transport now as well. So we can be quite brave and bold about, you know, the very easy steps that we're taking in the next 10 years or so, recognising that there's much more actually complexity around how you join these systems up in about five to 10 years time. OK, thank you. Great. There's um, there's a, a question that's moving on to a different subject now where we start talking about emissions targets from Peter Newman. He's saying, um, should we actually be um, tracking the carbon associated with our national consumption going forward in a sort of post-COVID world, uh, given the uh, and essentially include the carbon uh, footprint from our imported goods as we do more and more of that, uh, and particularly thinking about potential trade deals post-Brexit? Steve, have you? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think the UK should do exactly what what companies are are now trying to do. You know, as, as you as you know, I mean, all companies you know are pretty pretty much on top of scope one and two emissions now. And now the big question coming from all the ESG investors is, well, that's fantastic, but now what about scope three? You know, what about all the things that you are indirectly responsible for? So there's you know, there's I hate to say it's kind of an industry actually developing on how do we get our handle around what all the scope three are. And if industry and business is doing that, then I think the country as a whole has to do that as well. I completely agree with the point. Yeah. yeah. And Rob, any view from you on that one? Yeah, I mean, it, it's received a, a fair amount of attention in the, in the uh, progress report um, from the Committee on Climate Change. Um, and certainly, you know, consumption emissions are something that I think we need, we, we, which, which are being given more attention. Uh, in the conversation, they've always they've always been there, and there's always been voices that are advocating for us to bear in mind that we import most of the, you know, much, much of the carbon we're responsible for is embodied in things that we that we buy from other countries. 
it's a tricky one because in terms of um you know policy leadership the the, the most immediate levers to pull are around our own domestic emissions and i think you know if we if we're able to 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 experiment to show good practice to demonstrate what works in terms of reducing emissions from the electricity sector or or, or from from households or industry then then obviously we're we're uh, kind of like we lead others follow is a very sort of poor poor characterization of reality but nevertheless you know we do need uh, all countries to take steps with their own domestic policies in order to get embodied emissions under control so that you know countries where have a larger manufacturing sector than, than ours the the one thing that would have the biggest hit in, in the immediate term would be for them to reduce their coal burn and so uh, thinking about ways in which we can we can you know, help to enable that is is key to this, as well as tracking and being more focused on um, embodied emissions, consumption based accounting. Yeah, yeah, uh, okay, all right, thank you. Um, we're going to move on now to hydrogen. So, Steve, there's one in here where, um, again, from Peter, says, unlike green electricity, green hydrogen will be globally transportable. Will the UK be successful in creating enough green hydrogen to make it a significant contribution? for fueling inland heat and transport demands or will we end up importing that one too via global markets i know this is a subject you've been taking a lot of interest in recently what do you think yeah it is a subject i'm taking a lot of interest in but don't confuse a lot of interest with all of a sudden becoming an expert I, I <laughs> <laughs> um, but i will give you my view because I, I you know I, I think it is it is pretty clear and you know this louise as well that this government in particular do talk about hydrogen a lot yeah. My, my concern with that again is it's sort of a kind of sort of a, a flavor of the month as opposed to part of a real you know joined up plan for the future um, but it would certainly seem to me that with the amount of natural resources we have in renewables and um, particularly you know huge amounts of offshore wind potentially still to tap into and the location of that offshore wind in particular and the investment that we might otherwise have to make in our grid systems to try and uh, absorb it that using that Using hydrogen actually as a an energy storage medium for that is a is a huge opportunity. And then you know how we use that then in our heat systems. Maybe I'm not quite so sure about our transport systems in terms of heavy goods vehicles and things, but certainly in heat. Uh, and I, and as I look at that, just 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 to answer the question a bit more for fully as well. I, th I think you know we need to start thinking about um, even a place as small as the UK. As, as regionally slightly different. You know, we don't, so let's, let's just use the hydrogen as an example. You know, we don't have a natural gas reticulation system in the north of Scotland. You know, it, it doesn't go very far past Glasgow and Edinburgh. Actually, we truck a lot of LN, um, LNG up to try and get some gas there. So, you know, bringing a lot of wind into the north of Scotland and having some green hydrogen up there and heating with hydrogen up there, as opposed to down south, might be a very different approach, actually. But so I, you know, I think that's part of it. We'll start to see people thinking more locally about opportunities that are there. But the gas industry is pretty determined, I think, to reuse the system. And I think, you know, when we've invested as consumers so much in that infrastructure, the ability to hydrogenate methane very quickly and then move to hydrogen for a lot of our heat is clearly a big opportunity for us. Uh, and in there, I, I would be amazed actually if something around that wasn't part of the position that the UK takes in COP next year. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, uh, stick with you for a minute, Steve, because this is something you've got some experience of directly and things you're involved with. There's a couple of questions here, and one of those from David Wilkes about the where's the money coming from? Well, firstly, is the money there to invest? Uh, given government, well, governments worldwide are sucking up available borrowing to fund survival measures. Where does the where's the capital going to come from to fund a lot of this transition to a low carbon economy? Uh, and do do you ultimately think that the consumer will pay? So, and I've heard this debate quite a lot recently about whether or not the money is actually there, or it's other things that are part of the problem to to unlock the money. What's 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 your view, Steve? Um, well, let's start with the let's start with the obvious. I mean, consumers always pay eventually. It's just it's just how you pay and when you pay. You know, is it? But at some stage, you know, even all the money that we're that we're pumping into the economy at the moment, you know, we're going to have to pay for it sometime. Uh, perhaps we'll inflate our way out of that issue, but um, you know we're going to have to pay for it at some stage. Um, is there a lot of money? 
Well, there, there is actually interesting. I mean, all the things that I see at the moment, there, there is a huge amount of capital inflows into ESG funds. You know, there are, so all of the big in investors are looking for and determined to put more money to work in things that are associated with climate change, adaptation, and the green economy, and green energy in particular. So I think if I was answering that question for government, I'd go back to what do you need to do to ensure that we attract that money into the UK? And it's about consistency and confidence, et cetera, et cetera. Because there's a lot of cash out there that are, that are looking for the right opportunities to invest. So I, I don't think that's an issue. I, I really don't in the short term. OK, thank you. Uh, Rob, anything from you on either of those two points on hydrogen or the finance? Yeah, so one of the things I just say on hydrogen is um, I think that you probably find that the EI membership has quite a wide range of views about the potential role of hydrogen. Um, and, and Steve was, was perhaps representing the, the kind of bullish end of, 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 of the spectrum. I mean, hydrogen is a, a potentially uh, um, a huge opportunity in that it has characteristics that are quite, in, in many respects, similar to fossil fuels in terms of storability and the ability to use it as a buffer and all of those kinds of things. Um, but obviously, you know, when you take the carbon out of the molecule, that, that makes all of those things also more challenging, right? So I think we have to be aware of that, that it's much more difficult, for example, to put hydrogen in a tank in a car than it is to put petrol in a tank in a car, and that's why we don't already use it, you know what I mean? So, so I think there's a very, very open question as to whether hydrogen is, is fulfills a relatively niche role um, you know, perhaps to you know, green hydrogen for renewables balancing uh, a role in some markets, harder to decarbonize sections like uh, uh, sectors like HGVs, or whether it becomes you know the the, the bulk commodity of the future, replacing large parts of the fossil fuel industry. And either of those things are possible, uh, and there's other possibilities as well, like trucking it around in the form of ammonia and so on. So I think you know these are these are really really big fundamental questions. I mean, to come back to the question that was asked. Were it to become uh, a commodity, uh, you know, equivalent to, to to fossil fuels, some of it would be green hydrogen that we were able to produce ourselves. Yes, it would. But would it really matter if some of it was actually uh, internationally produced and traded in a global market? Why would it? Why would it be any different from LNG in that respect? Exactly what we would expect. And in many respects, you know, climate change is a global problem. That's exactly what we would need. So if you're at the ambitious end of the kind of hydrogen uh, spectrum, then, you know, we would want to be seeing it as, as, as being internationally traded and transferred all over the place, you know, just as we see now, um, now with fossil fuels. And, and on the finance piece, you know, we could easily spend more than the next 21 minutes that we've got uh, uh, talking about, about clean uh, green finance. I just wanted to uh, I, I'd absolutely reiterate one of the things that Steve said which is that we're a relatively small part of the global whole. Um, there's, there's growing uh, green energy markets and uh, environmental products and services markets right around the world. And so the thing that we need to keep focused on is attracting those financial flows, so, which we've been quite successful at doing, uh, you know, for example, in, 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 in electricity generating renewables. So it's keeping those financial flows coming in to the UK, but not just doing that, also making sure that there's UK value added, which we've got better at, but perhaps historically didn't really care about or pay attention to. And so I think there's an industrial policy challenge that also sits alongside that, yeah. um, that financial flow uh, challenge. Yeah. Just thanks, Rob, because I, I hopefully you helped to clarify for people some of my views on hydrogen. I, I, I agree with you. I mean, I, uh, I don't see it as the sort of the great white knight that's coming over the horizon to solve all these things, but I, I do think there's some niche applications. The 12 months, as I thought a bit more about it, I can see real opportunity. Project just, just on the call here that um, I know is being developed at the moment in the Middle East, which is solar, making ammonia, transporting the ammonia then into Europe to actually get a hydrogen market in Europe. So there are, there are some really interesting things going on here. I don't, I don't personally see it as a big replacement for fossil fuel, but I do see it as, as, as creating some real opportunities for, for some of those hard to get at sectors. And I wouldn't put aside there for, you know, cement manufacturing and steel, for example, where hydrogen, you know, could be the answer to some of their 
um, their carbon issues going forwards. Thank you. OK, we've got a, another question in from Diana Davison. Actually, there's a couple that are related. So uh, this is one for you, probably, Steve. She said, are energy companies the best choice to build our energy internet? Oh, it's disappeared. Uh, related to that is uh, another question which says, well, many renewables are generated by organisations who are not in the energy industry. How is the Energy Institute looking to engage and collaborate in supporting and partnering with them? Um, but let me just come back to, to, to that while we uh, see if Steve's signal uh, reconnects. So, uh, Diana, um, we do already work with a lot of companies, actually, who are large consumers of, or small and large consumers of energy. So, uh, and as I think you'll be a bit familiar with our, some of our work on energy management uh, and energy efficiency, particularly uh, in supporting companies to, to make improvements there, we spend a lot of time and also, interestingly, related to your other point about where the energy companies are the best choice to build our energy internet, um, we've also got an increasing number of companies that are working on, as, as I guess, digital businesses primarily, that are looking at the energy se sector and looking at the services that energy provides uh, and seeing opportunities to be to use technology uh, and digital solutions to be a bridge between the energy consumer, as you and I as the consumer, uh, and 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 interacting with the the, the supplier of, of of energy services, so so that's quite an interesting space that we're starting to see new and very different companies that definitely aren't uh, what you would consider or describe as traditional energy companies doing that particular piece of uh, piece of work there. Steve, have we got you back on, or have you disappeared? Yeah, no, board band playing up is saying to me the he's message. So, yeah, we yeah, can't yeah. Hear us, yeah, no, he's, he's messaged and saying his board band's uh, playing up, so he's going to try and stay on, uh, but he can't hear us right at the minute. So let's let's carry on. Carry on. So, I mean, Louise, I can make a few comments if you like in response yeah, to please. those questions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think that if you look at the the energy industry, I mean, I, I don't. I, be quite interesting to, to 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 if we were able to have a, a conversation in the room to find out, you know. You know what what the what the questioner thinks is meant by an energy company. I mean, if, even if you think about yeah. the, even if you think about traditional energy companies, it's very sector specific. So, uh, uh, an oil and gas traditional oil and gas uh, vertically integrated producer and retailer is a completely different proposition from a traditional vertically integrated electricity uh, utility. Uh, the gas market straddles the two. Uh, there's differences uh, between network operators and uh, generators, and there's obviously differences again uh, at the retail end of the spectrum. So I don't know that I even know what an energy company is. And certainly, if you look at the mix of uh, energy institute uh, memberships on a company perspective, and if you even say, for example, look at the British uh, retail market for, for oil and gas, there's a huge amount of new entry. Uh, we've seen the big vertically integrated companies deintegrating, some of them divesting of bits of their business. We've seen companies that used to be uh, niche players like Ovo and Octopus becoming quite significant. And so I think there's been a huge amount of change. Um, and so if you are of the view that, 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 that change begets innovation, we ought to be seeing a huge amount of innovation at the moment in, in energy. I can see that I've still got two more pages of questions that people have sent in. So what I'm going to do is going to take those away and uh, put, put some answers to those and, and get thoughts from, from Rob, Steve and, and myself to contribute to those and share those with you as participants that are on the call today. Um, I would like to thank everybody for joining the call. Uh, and um, being with us here this morning. Uh, apologies for a couple of the, the broadband glitches that we've had. There were a couple of questions around what we do going forward with the results of the barometer, um, because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's hugely valuable to harness all of this thinking and, and try and share it with people who have responsibility for making decisions and shaping the system. So we've already sent the information that's come through some report through to the teams in Bayes who are designing the recovery packages. Uh, and uh, and we hope that that'd be helpful. And as Chris Stark, as the CEO of the Commission on Climate Change, uh, said to us, it, the level of certainty by energy professionals should give ministers confidence to act. And we, we absolutely hope that that's how this work is helpful. 
Uh, and there are various events where we're going to be coming up sharing uh, the contents of the report in our own energy efficiency conferences and various things that we're doing. Also in uh, some work uh, with the British Institute of Energy Economics, uh, which we scheduled later on in the year. And we're constantly looking for opportunities. So if any of you on the call have, would like to see us sharing this more widely, then please do uh, let me or one of the team members know. And as I said, we'll promise to come back to you on the balance of the, the questions that we've got here still to answer for you. Uh, but in the meantime, please do take care, stay safe and well, and we'll look forward to catching up and seeing you again very soon. Thanks very much indeed. Bye.